Hi, good afternoon, everyone here in the room, and good evening, good morning, wherever you might be on, on Facebook. I'm really happy to be here today to talk about this really important topic about audience behavior and psychology and how that fits in with how people understand news stories. So I want to start with a really light question that I'm sure we'll be able to solve in the next couple of minutes, which is how do we know what to believe? And this question, I know it sounds very lofty in like a philosophy class, and some of you probably want to get up and leave, but I promise it's practical, it has practical implications, and people face this question every day. Obviously, we all do this. I'm giving these two headlines here as, a, as an example of obviously the conflicting information that people often find in my field, which is healthcare and, and science, but it happens in a lot of places. Um, these two s headlines came out on the same day, um, basically, n new studies suggest that vitamin D decreases risk of cancer. Vitamin D among older women does not significantly reduce risk of cancer. Same day, same study. And the top one is from the university uh, press release from where the scientists were from. The bottom one is from JAMA, the, art, the uh, uh, journal that published the paper. And um, uh, w really, the JAMA one is more correct, but the point here is to show, obviously, what people face every day, but I also really want to point out that it, a lot of people like to say, oh, especially in this field, it's the media's fault because they're showing all these different things and they're exaggerating, and it's very easy to do that, but it, um, it's actually everyone's fault to a certain extent. I think we all really have the responsibility to anticipate these situations and understand how to deal with them. It turns out actually in the, for the top headline, one of the scientists actually gave the quote to the press office that this was the most important breakthrough of the past century. Um, meanwhile, the study didn't actually have any f interesting <laughs> findings. So, um, you know, good example of where these problems are coming from multiple places. Um, and I want to back up for a second just so you get a little bit more of a sense of who is this person on the stage talking to me about all this. Um, I'm the author of this book, as, um, a, as uh, Trevor already said, Denying to the Grave, Why We Ignore the Facts That Will Save Us, which came out from Oxford University Press about uh, maybe eight months ago now. And uh, I wrote the book with my father, Jack Gorman. There's a picture of us. Um, he's, he, has a history, he has a long career in uh, psychiatry and neuroscience, and uh, my background is public health primarily as well as psychology. And the book really explores those psychological reasons behind why do people not believe facts, um, specifically in science and health, um, but it, it obviously has implications for other areas. And looks also into some of the ways that we can deal with that issue if we understand the psychology better. And when the book came out, and then shortly after the American elections happened, which I think all of you probably know the outcome of that, um, everybody was asking me, what are you, are you gonna enact some of these solutions? And I said, oh, you know what? I hadn't thought about it, but actually it's really urgent. Um, it's becoming more urgent. And so um, founded this organization called Critica, and I'm happy to talk to you more about it um, afterwards as well, what we do. So I want to go back to understanding how people read. What state are people in when they're reading, and, and what, where do they go wrong, right? Um, and so this, is, this little boy is really all of us. Um, we read in a very distracted state. Um, that's a very common thing. And I, and I actually found something on Twitter this morning that was a nice encapsulation of the distracted state in which we tend to live. So I'm going to read it to you. This is apparently an email from a professor to a student. Um, and uh, I, don't, I, didn't, I did the, the bad reader thing, which I didn't check if this was a real email or just a joke. But it's OK for now. Um, it says, I'm emailing to let you know that I have marked you absent for today's class, regardless of if you were physically there. Our class TA was sitting behind you during class, and he reported that you were looking at pictures of, quote, puppy golden retrievers with party hats on for the entire class period while laughing to yourself. As wonderful as that activity is, I strongly advise that you do, not in your, that, you do that in your free time, not in class, and then ends, see you on Tuesday, which you know, it's just a great touch there. Um, so mostly this is funny, but the point is actually distraction is very important from a psychological standpoint because what tends to happen when we're distracted 
is that we pay less attention to actual signals of quality in truth claims and, and quality of evidence, and we become more persuaded by what we call peripheral cues, things like how charismatic is the person, how sure do they seem of what they're saying, and even how many arguments did they make, um, with kind of no regard for whether those were good arguments. The other thing is, I'm sure all of you are familiar with the phenomenon of people not reading things all the way through, um, so I don't really need to belabor that. But an important thing also about our psychology and when we read is that, or hear things, we favor the beginning of what we hear, so the first thing you hear or, or come into contact with or read becomes much more prominent in our minds than what you read later. Oftentimes you make up your mind right away, and it's actually very, very hard to change people's minds, which I'm sure a lot of you have also uh, encountered. And I just, to give a little bit of a, this is a very oversimplified version of um, how <laughs> the brain works in this phenomenon, but really this is called confirmation bias, which a lot of you by now have most likely heard about as well. But what it means is it has to do with the idea that you look for and favor information that really favors what you already believe. And we actually, what's very interesting about this is we see it really happening in the brain. So there's this part of the brain called the limbic system that is responsible for a lot of our emotions. And there's one portion, that little orange thing called the amygdala, which seems small, but it's actually hugely important because it, it's kind of, it really processes fear. Um, and in some studies, and again, oversimplified version of this, but I'm going quickly. In some studies, we've seen that actually people, when you get them to express uh, something that they do not agree with, their amygdala lights up. So there's this very basic biological fear response, like a fight or flight thing. And if you get them to say something they do agree with, they can ha e even have a, um, a, a spike in the um, presence of dopamine, so kind of a rush of dopamine to say that's the reward kind of pathway. So they're, re they're rewarded for thinking what they already think, and people are basically punished by having fear if they have to go against what they think. And the same thing happens with group psychology as well. Going f with the group is very um, rewarding. Going against the group is kind of fundamentally causes this kind of fear. And the group part, I think, is also very important when I know all of you are thinking about um, obviously online communities, online journalism, and we, in some ways it's easier to join a group nowadays than it has been in the past. You can, our friends here at Facebook have a lot of them. When you click on that link, you know, it might not activate the same thing as being part of a really formal group, but in some cases, it, in many cases it actually does. It's the barrier to entry can be very low, and it's sort of that, it switches its psychological mechanism to, oh, now I'm part of a group, I have to go along with everything. And this is really important because it's good to understand when you're writing for a particular audience or you're writing about a particular topic, especially things that are very entrenched. So when people really have strong views about a topic, it's a little bit controversial or there's a lot of kind of groups that are around that. There's a lot of identity politics in that area. Um, people will be especially resistant to facts. And uh, we've heard some discussion about this in the session, uh, two sessions back. I, I heard some great discussion about this as well. But people will be very resistant to facts. They can actually backfire. People can become more entrenched um, in these situations if you approach them with a lot of factual information. So it's good to understand wh when you're in that situation. So usually at this point, okay, either you've been ignoring me the whole time because you're looking at golden retrievers, which so you feel great, or you've been listening to me and now you're feeling depressed. This person just said that everybody is wired to not believe anything, be stubborn, it's the apocalypse, God is dead, I I'm just gonna go home and cry. Well, hold on, okay. I Hopefully I did not push you to that because I think that there are some things that we can do, and this is what I'm really interested in, and I hope that we can talk about it more later as well, but uh, very briefly, uh, from a high level, here are sort of three main things. So one is what I was just talking about. Evaluate the topic and understand which, which, of, which of these topics have strong groups, emotions, and identities around them. And in those cases, again, that really factual approach is gonna be especially problematic. And so you have to, there needs to be alternative strategies and there are some good ones that, that can work in certain cases. Um, provide as much context and nuance up front as possible. Again, this has to do with the idea that people make up their minds early on. So if there's kind of a nuance to a topic, especially if it's one of these more controversial ones where people fight and they have very strong I ideas, um, you. You want to anticipate that, and you want to put that nuance early. 
um, so that people are not getting to that at the end and they just d ignore it because they already made up their mind. And then I know the resistance to that is, well, in context and nuance, that's kind of boring, and we have to engage people, and it's more interesting to kind of give them, you know, the, this kind of statement of this is how it is. And I, I uh, completely understand that. Um, but I think there's an opportunity, and I know that there are some great organizations and, and journalists and writers doing this, exploring ways to make the complexity, especially in this field that I'm in, in science and healthcare, make that complexity attractive and engaging, um, and make that, um, have that be really interesting to people. Um, there are also two other. Um, one is to uh, actually um, ask Facebook to fix all our problems. And I've heard that one today. And the other one is to just give up and just publish pictures of golden retrievers with party hats and cat videos, which, you know, always viable options. Um, and then the other one is um, we can talk about Critica and what we're doing and how we might be able to help you. So I'm going to stop there, but thank you very much. And I'm going to invite my friend Porik, <laughs> got the name right, up next. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Porik Ryan, and I'm on the news team at Storyful. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the French election and some communication campaigns that we saw online which attempted to influence the election. Uh, before I do that, though, I'd like to show you a video of some work Storyful did in relation to a chemical attack in Kanshikun in Syria in April of this year. And I want to show it to you because I think what it gets across is the multi-platform nature of a lot of the work we do on Storyful. And um, we find that the whole story is very rarely to be found on one platform alone. And so we've used a good deal of platforms working together to try and get a more complete picture. And I think we'll see a similar thing in the French election. So first of all, I'll show you that video. Eric. There should be sound of the merge showing lifeless but otherwise uninjured bodies described as showing the victims of a suspected chemical attack in the town, as well as footage showing airstrikes targeting hospitals and care centers tending to the injured. In the hours and days that followed, the scale of the loss of life and the human tragedy became evident, prompting international condemnation and military action. In the immediate aftermath of the strikes, Stoichel's team of journalists worked to verify the source, date, and location of videos emerging on social media, allowing our clients to accurately and confidently report on the developing story. The earliest reports from established media activists in Kan Shikun provided location information. Stoifel used a combination of manually curated lists available to our clients, contacts with known activists on the ground, and in-house cross-platform search tools to monitor content emerging from the scene. Videos from multiple independent opposition activist groups showed matching scenes and the same identifiable individuals, allowing us to build up a clear picture of events. The sight of chaotic scenes at a triage point filmed by both Syrian civil defense and anti-government media could later be seen damaged in activist footage taken during and after a strike on that facility. And the activist in that footage, Adi Al Abdallah, was confirmed to be in Khan Sheikhoun when he later captured footage from the reported site of the chemical attacks. His videos showed the ordinance used and allowed Storyful to geolocate the scene to an area north of the town. Using distinctive silos seen behind Al Abdallah and analysis of a nearby junction. This analysis was further confirmed a day later by drone footage of the scene. More than an hour's drive to the north in the Nish, east of Idlib city, patients were arriving from Khan Sheikhoun, according to Sajil Islam, a UK trained doctor volunteering in Syria. Islam posted videos showing unresponsive people with pinpoint pupils, consistent with a Centers for Disease Control fact sheet on sarin gas. Just over two weeks later, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons published what it called incontrovertible laboratory results that the victims of the Khan Sheikhoun attack were exposed to sarin or a sarin-like substance. Using a combination of social media monitoring tools, traditional journalism, and modern video verification techniques, Storyful was able to provide its clients with usable videos from verified sources on the ground, allowing them to accurately report on a rapidly developing story in the hours immediately after the attack. And in the days that followed, Storyful was able to build a collection tracing the human impact and the international response. So what you'll see there is it was working across a range of platforms that Storyful was able to provide a more comprehensive picture of the story as it evolved. You'll see a similar dynamic at work in the French election where there was a number of online campaigns targeting Emmanuel Macron 
and supporting the Front National's Marine Le Pen. And these featured on a wide range of platforms. You'll see and be familiar with the platforms on the right, I'm sure, public platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. On the left was 4chan's poll thread, um, which became a location where a lot of these campaigns were started, were coordinated from, and where tools were provided for pro Le Pen activists. Similarly, on Jeux Video, a French language rough equivalent of 4chan, it's a, a chat app generally used by gamers. And on Discord, a closed network, which is also a kind of a, a Slack-like chat app used for gamers. These were also locations where these campaigns targeting Macron and supporting Le Pen were coordinated. Discord in particular requires users to have specific passwords before they can gain access to servers where this, this kind of behavior was coordinated. And I just want to walk you through a couple of examples of the kinds of tactics and the kinds of campaigns we saw. This is a relatively busy slide, but if I can talk you through it, on the top left, you'll see a screen grab from a 4chan thread which sought to influence the election by backing Le Pen and attacking Macron. But it's a little bit more than simply angry ravings of disaffected young men. There's a degree of sophistication to the thread. At the top, you'll see links provided to advice videos um, where people, again, can get tips on how best to attack Macron. There's links to a meme bank where people could access pre-prepared images. At the bottom left, you'll see a graphic from the same thread where in the thread, the online users are discussing the best themes that might be used, which might be the most effective in carrying out the message that they want to spread. The center graphic there is a screen grab from a Discord server which, again, was used throughout the campaign to try and support Le Pen. And what the person is asking for there, I hope you'll all forgive the small graphic, but what the person is asking for there is amplification of a tweet that they've composed with a pro-Le Pen meme on it. So what we saw throughout the campaign was behavior on one platform, oftentimes a closed network such as Discord, being manifest in a public platform such as Twitter, but very much coordinated between the two. And on the right-hand side there, you'll see graphics from a thing they called a Twitter raid, which happened on April 29th. At 6 p.m. French time on April 29th, French Twitter was bombarded with pro-Le Pen and anti-Macron memes using a number of commonly used hashtags that were already in circulation. But, of course, this wasn't a spontaneous thing. It had been announced by a pro-Le Pen uh, user the day before and was coordinated again from a Discord server. On the Discord server, the activists spoke about their tactics and they said the idea was to bombard French Twitter and get their message across there. Perhaps the highest profile campaign, which I'm sure you'll all have been aware of, was the very late twist in the campaign when a giant dump of emails and other documents relating to the Macron campaign was published the Friday before the second round of voting. The dissemination of this information is also interesting when we consider how information is shared. Ahead of time, a right-wing activist from the US, William Craddock, and an organization Craddock is linked to, Disobedient Media, previewed an apparent revelation to come about Macron. Very shortly afterwards, on another 4chan thread, as the center here shows, there was a link to this massive dump of documents. And very quickly afterwards, another right-wing activist in the US, Jack Vosobiak, links to the 4chan thread, and very quickly thereafter, WikiLeaks pick it up, and the message gets spread. Interestingly, this was probably covered more widely in English language media rather than French because of the timing and the embargo on any material relating to the election. Outside of that, though, there are an infrastructure in place of sites which some might call fake news sites, some may simply say they are sites known to publish material of a dubious nature. And what that means for journalists is, even if your mainstream media organization isn't willing to cover this dubious material, there's already an infrastructure in place that's ready to propagate the message. But, as you'll all know, it didn't work in France. The activist's candidate of choice wasn't elected, Macron is president. And I think there are a number of reasons which could be posited as contributing factors in curtailing the influence of these online campaigns. So on the left here, 
you'll see a collaborative effort cross-check, which was run by First Draft and Google News Labs, in which a number of French news organizations got together to verify, to rebut, and debunk stories as the campaign went on. There's also a degree to which increasing sophistication on the parts of journalists played a part. So you'll see Liberation's Desintox logo at the bottom and Le Mans' Decodex. The graphic on the top in the center is a screen grab of a tweet from a BuzzFeed journalist, Ryan Broderick, who spotted an attempted smear being launched on 4chan involving Macron and his stepdaughter. And because Broderick and BuzzFeed were so quick to the story, we saw people in real time rebutting the claim, citing the BuzzFeed article. On the right, you'll see that there was also just an element of audience skepticism. Some of the claims, in particular that one about Macron and his stepdaughter, were simply incredible for users online, and they just weren't buying it. The graphic on the bottom right is the logo of some research carried out on French Twitter users following the first round of the election. And the research found that, in general, French users shared higher quality material on Twitter than their American counterparts. And in the wake of the second round of the election, the managing editor of Liberation was quoted in a New York Times article as saying that the lack of a Fox News equivalent in France was also an element in not allowing these sorts of campaigns to be spread widely. All that means there are questions arising for newsrooms and for platforms. And the first I would ask is, who is your 4chan correspondent? And by that, I kind of mean a shorthand for who, in practical terms, in your newsroom is conversant with 4chan, with Discord, with whatever the equivalent is in your jurisdiction? And who, on a day-to-day -day basis, is going to work that into their workflow? The key for journalists and newsrooms, I would say, is to think practically rather than in theoretical terms and to make sweeping these sorts of areas where these kinds of stories might arise part of your day-to-day -day behaviors. There's also a question around measurements. People need, and newsrooms need, to be able to measure the key piece of social media material which spikes and which makes a rumor a newsworthy story. Newsrooms also need to know when a story is insignificant so that they don't spend time down rabbit holes tracking coverage on minor misinformation sites which, until they're covered or debunked, are not in themselves hugely significant. And finally, there are questions for the platforms themselves. Because if we all consider that this misinformation is a significant problem to be dealt with, how can we gauge the scale of the problem without access to data about it? And how can that access to the data be combined with concerns about privacy? And finally, having decided that there is misinformation out there, who makes that decision about what's misinformation and what's not? About what should be censored effectively and what should not? So there are questions I hope we can discuss in the aftermath. Thanks very much. <laughs> and I'm now going to hand over to Eugenia from DCU. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad to be the last year um, this last speaker after these two fascinating presentations because I think my uh, work complements very well the two perspectives we heard earlier. So I'm hoping also to provide some kind of like nuance to uh, all these kinds of like discussions we had on analytics. So um, this is a part, what I'm will be talking about today is part of a broader study uh, funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland uh, that uh, has to do with news consumption. So basically we have like a lot of uh, detailed analytics coming from automatic, automatically from algorithms that uh, uh, operate on social media platforms. We have a lot of um, uh, survey evidence that come from large studies like for example the um, Reuters digital news um, uh, consumption study, but what we want to do is to add some kind of like depth to these kinds of like data by asking people to keep a media diary of their own consumption and also to follow this up with interviews and more qualitative um, uh, study because it's not only the, the news consumption practices that we're interested in but also the embeddedness, embeddedness of these in the everyday life of people. So that's what we were primarily interested in. So when you get analytics, for example, 
it already implies that the person is interested in the news, but we don't have any context, we don't know how big is uh, news consumption, how big, how important it is for the person, and what are the other habits uh, regarding this kind of like uh, news consumption. So I'm hoping to offer some kind of um, uh, nuance um, to that and some kind of like more in-depth understanding of how people go about uh, consuming the news in their everyday lives. And I'm using two main theoretical approaches. One is the domestication theory. Uh, that uh, Both of these approaches, domestication theory and uses and gratifications, come out of the dissatisfaction that people had with uh, theories of media effects. And this, I think, um, is a, a useful thing to keep in mind when we talk about misinformation or fake facts and things like that. People uh, at one level not so easy to manipulate precisely because of these kinds of like mediating factors. So people adapt things that the information that they come across to their own kinds of like uh, uh, social context and, and backgrounds and they also develop new habits, they adapt and adopt uh, new practices uh, as they make sense in their own uh, everyday life. And uses and gratifications is a very well-known social psychological perspective. So basically it does not ask what media do to people, but we ask what do people do with the media. So these are the two kinds of like theoretical perspectives that, that inform uh, this kind of study. So these are very pre preliminary findings that I'm going to be presenting, more suggestive rather than definitive. Um, so here we're based on 10 um, uh, people who kept detailed diaries of their media consumption uh, for, um, uh, for uh, two weeks, and we followed this up with in-depth interviews, uh, and we are presenting now the findings that pertain to uh, the infamous millennials. N so we have other kinds of like demographics, but these come from um, this cohort. So we asked about the devices that people use because there is a kind of like an overestimation perhaps of the, 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 the value and the use of mobile phones in people's lives. And we found out that um, also because this comes out of a context that everyone you ask says, well, I'm not watching any television. And you kind of think, well, you know what, you may be watching a little bit more television than you originally thought. So what we found here is basically that um, all kinds of like devices are popular. People use different devices in different contexts. Um, so television, mobiles, laptops, consoles, tablets, everything was used. Um, a new finding for me has been that people are actually using gaming consoles to uh, watch um, the YouTube on their television set. So I see a lot of you nodding, but anyway, that was a new one for me. Um, so context and convenience determine which device is going to be used. So when you're on the bus, you're going to use your mobile. But when you're at home, you're going to use a different kind of like device. Often some of these devices would be used in parallel. So you'd, you'd have your phone WhatsApping your friend whilst watching um, uh, news on television. Um, another thing that we found in terms of devices is that um, Although maybe the mobile phone could be seen as being more dominant throughout like the day, in the evening it was more larger kinds of like screens. So television and perhaps even uh, laptops. In terms of platforms and uh, apps that people used, a very wide variety, of course our sample is not representative, but it was striking that there was no pattern. So you'd have one person very um, interested in news, uh, another person very interested in uh, animal videos. Um, people would have um, Netflix, I think that was pretty kind of like standard, but they would also have public service broadcasters, uh, um, RT in the context of Ireland, uh, as an app to use. Uh, so a very wide variety, no pattern there, and, and um, people would, and all these were n are not mutually exclusive, so people who are into sports might also be uh, into uh, animal videos, and they might also um, watch the news on a public service broadcaster. Uh, in terms of habits, I think this is one of the most significant findings, the social aspects of news consumption. There is a lot of alone consumption, and I think that uh, hearing all these analytics, there is this assumption that people consume the news as individuals. But in fact, we found here that the social context is very, very significant, and that people derive, I'll talk about this in a minute, but people derive a lot of like pleasures and a lot of use out of consuming news um, in the context of social groups. So um, sometimes we found, uh, and this is quite uh, interesting, that 
people would form ad hoc groups just in order to consume certain shows on Netflix or certain kinds of like documentaries and current affairs programs. So watching it alone is not as fun, as much fun as watching it in the presence of your friends or in a social context. Um, funnily enough, if they couldn't find the face-to-face so the, the -face social context to consume this, then they would go online and try to find digital friends to, to derive this kind of like gratification. Uh, recommendations were very important, um, so sometimes the automatic ones of like YouTube's autoplay, but uh, the side videos as well would be important because um, people would just like uh, be carried by the platform as it were. Uh, but friends' recommendations are crucial for drama and entertainment. And again, I think this speaks to the social value of consuming something. So you wouldn't consume a, a program that no, no one else in your, um, uh, in your social background or your social group is consuming. So, uh, or if you did do this, you'd try to get them to consume it as well so that you can talk about it. Um, sometimes, and that was another significant finding, sharing news and links was done with explicit purpose that people wanted to talk about this. So sharing is a form of recommendation. Of course, we knew that's that already, but it has like the, this most kind of like immediate recommendation is like, look, I find this interesting, I want to talk about it. I put it on my wall so that people would react and then I can, I can form a conversation around this. Um, so when a news story breaks, it is important to share and discuss it with friends. Uh, the fire festival story that um, you may remember from a few days ago, that was a big one. So breaking news are big, not only because they're happening, but because also you want to uh, understand them and make sense of them by talking uh, uh, through talking about them with your friends. Um, so then that would drive this kind of like, this would be a very typical pattern. You will share it on Facebook and then use WhatsApp and Twitter to see what others are, uh, are saying about it, but also to discuss it with your friends. Um, documentaries and current affair vi affairs videos, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are also socially consumed. I have a long quote here, but it's just very important to uh, embed this kind of like consumption in terms of a very kind of like significant social context. So uh, commenting on news is part of the sociality of news consumption. In terms of uses and gratification, I'm sure this will take you back to your um, student days, so <laughs> uh, very busy slide with a lot of like different categories, but basically uh, just um, this is based on a, a study that was done back in 1973 um, in terms of which kinds of like specific gratification, specific uses people associate with different kinds of media. But we kind of like adapted this to our specific context and use devices, platforms and, and particular genres within, uh, within the broader genre of the news. And these are some of our findings. So people would um, derive cognitive affective and affective uh, gratifications and would use uh, the, uh, the news in order to get these uh, kinds of like, to fulfill these kinds of needs. And then we have the personal integrative and social integrative. Integrative means that it integrates both cognitive and affective needs. And these are uh, quite significant. So, um, you can see uh, you can see here that um, in terms of um, uh, the cognitive uh, use of the news, we have um, people are motivated by um, by their interests. And here is most of the analytics would speak to this category. I'm interested in something, and I go and find out information about this something. So I think that's um, partly what explains and what drives the. Uh, the news consumption, but there are also important affective elements involved so that um, people, for example, who would watch documentaries derive aesthetic pleasures out of watching documentaries. And, and also this uh, is the case with uh, the short news videos that you find in social media. In terms of the personal integrative gratification, uh, this is very interesting because uh, this kind of uh, uh, need speaks to people acquiring confidence, status, and credibility. So you don't want to be the one in your social context who is going to be uh, you know, sharing fake news. You want to be the one to whom people turn to because they're credible and because they have something important to say. And, uh, and this is important because that means that uh, uh, that drives people to 
find different perspectives. And I think this is an important corrective of this idea that if I see a, a, a fake news item, I will share it or I will just believe it um, without thinking about it. Notwithstanding, of course, um, uh, the kind of like important uh, work that Sarah presented earlier. But it has to be mediated by other factors as well. So um, we have uh, we found some evidence for looking for multiple news sources and a variety of perspective ju perspective just to address this particular gratification. In terms of the social uh, integrated gratification, connections with family, uh, friends, and the world are very important. So you want to know what is happening in the world. So again, this is a corrective of this idea that we're all entrapped into some kind of like filter bubble. But people want to know what's happening outside the filter bubble. They are motivated um, to look for, for different kind of information. So this is why scheduled news is important here because of course you get the news from your own social feeds, you get them from your own social background, but you want to know what else is happening and this is an important need that is still covered by uh, scheduled news on television. Uh, comments and tweets are also important here because they somehow connect you with uh, the broader world. And fi uh, finally, um, th we have the gratification of tension release and diversion and escapism, you might want to call this. And this drives a lot of this kind of like consumption of, of uh, funny videos, uh, weird news um, and, uh, and animal videos and things like that. I an important part of uh, um, consumption of uh, online videos. A crucial finding that we found and which is not present in the early, oops, sorry. Oh no, there, there it is. And it wasn't found in the early literature on uses and gratification is the negative gratification. So we knew um, already from the literature that uh, certain things would lead people to avoid media consumption. But what we found here um, is that certain news items, certain kinds of news, and certain news brands would be avoided because people would consider them either uh, unpleasant or uh, non-informative. So people don't want to see violence, for example, or some most people don't want to see violence. So if there is a very graphic video, people would will tend to avoid it. If there is violence um, against animals, people will tend to avoid this. If your news feed is full of like really hardcore negative news, people will try to avoid this kind of stuff and will go to YouTube and watch some cute animal videos to just offset this kind of like um, negativity. Uh, in, in, in terms of a very new finding as well, we found that there is a lot of frustration and this kind of like frustration has to do with the automatic systems of the platforms and the recommendations, the fact that somehow they seem to control um, what you're going to see and you're losing kind of like uh, discretion over what you do with your timeline. So this is negative and people get frustrated and get angry um, and annoyed by this. Um, so they feel they have wasted their time and they try to avoid it. And also when it comes to this, technical glitches are very, very off-putting. So what kinds of like conclusions can we draw out of all this? Well, they're not conclusions, but interim kind of like observations more like it. So in terms of devices, they all matter. In terms of platforms, individual preferences matter, but some platforms are seen as kind of like everybody has them. So they're like, you know, the, th the, the, the things that you have to have. Uh, consumption is both personal but also social and although much has been made of the personal dimension we have still to research the social dimension and the kinds of like meanings that people um, uh, um, derive or obtain through uh, this kind of like um, consumption, social consumption. In terms of uses and gratifications, we have different kinds and forms of media meeting different needs but we also have the rise of negative gratifications and this is something that is important. Finally, we have some evidence that news consumption is driven by topics. So you see something that is topical and then that drives you to go into more depth into this particular kind of topic. And this is related to the second category here, this mic the micro news. I know that most journalists are very, very keen to find out what's happening in the parliament, what's happening in the courts, what's new, what did the foreign secretary say, whatever. But people are not so interested in these kinds of news. People would use this perhaps as impetus or as a kind of like a trigger to go and find out about 
broader social issues. So for example, to give you an example of uh, what um, some of our people, our informants told us, there was a story here in Ireland about um, uh, the church getting possession of a particular hospital, a maternity hospital. So this kind of like, tr this was the news, but this triggered a lot of discussion and a lot of like, uh, impetus for people to go and find out what is the m more detail about this specific topic. Suicide would be another such uh, uh, news item. So for example, uh, there was a high profile suicide yesterday of the uh, singer of the of Audio Slave, and this would drive people to look into mental health and then uh, move into more depth in terms of specific news. So this is part also of this kind of like social um, news consumption. Um, Finally, creating new community with digital-only friends to talk about issues of interest. So if people in your own network, in your own uh, group, like social group, uh, are not interested in a particular topic, then you'll go online uh, specifically looking for um, uh, people to talk about this. So I'm going to stop here and invite um, the two speakers, Sarah and Porik, to come up and, um, and take questions. All right, those were three awesome and meaty discussions. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, I think to keep to time, because I know it's getting to the end of the day, we might have to cut the Q&A, uh, but the speakers are able to hang out after, so feel free to stop, uh, stop them here and ask them for questions, uh, or later this afternoon. For those of you who are watching the live stream, uh, thank you, I'm sorry we didn't have time for questions. Um, if you want to bounce over to Twitter, we have the Twitter handles for each of the presenters listed on our website, which is dublin17.journalists, plural, journalists.org. So dublin17.journalists.org. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to give you guys a big hand. That was super media and all, all kinds of fascinating information, so thank you.